Our production facility is we use a 24 by 48 uh, Quonset hut. It's a roll form greenhouse that we actually lease from the Rodale Institute. We have two gas powered or propane powered heaters in the unit as well as two gable uh, and ventilation fans. In addition to that, we have two small circulation fans in the greenhouse and uh, a circulation tube, a polyethylene tube, down the center of the greenhouse. We have uh, 11 9-foot by 5-foot benches. They're soil-filled benches. On top of those, we, we just lay uh, wooden planks. We also have one table on the, green, on the end of the greenhouse, a, a 10-foot long table with five 10-foot uh, agritape heating mats. We can use that as a nursery area. We have two thermostats to control those heating mats so we can zone them according to different crops' needs. In terms of ergonomic concerns, we've built a nice potting table in our greenhouse. It's, a, I believe, a 42-inch high countertop height. Uh, we put a nice uh, smooth melanine top on it so it's easy to keep clean, and uh, as well as a shelf below just for a foot rest when you're working. And we have a bunch of, we've scavenged old stools, stools of all sorts of different shapes and sizes. So it's comfortable both to work sitting and standing at the table when you're, when you're there all day. The biggest thing I would say that, that's a detriment for our size greenhouse setup is the size. Again, we're 48 by 24. I would like to be bigger than that at this stage. So I don't have to move things out into maybe a cold frame as, as early as I do now. Planning is the most important thing you can do in terms of efficiency and farm production uh, that we work on in the winter, gen generally in January and February. We do a general crop plan, we do a field plan, and we do a greenhouse plan. The greenhouse plan is really good for in terms of uh, determining your needs for production that year, one in terms of amounts of potting soil, amounts of flats you're going to need, and of course the amount of seeds you're going to need. We really like having a good plan also because then when you get into greenhouse season, you don't have to think about what you're doing anymore. You can pretty much look at the plan and, uh, and read right off, and, and it's also really useful in terms of having employees that you can hand them the plan and say, okay, we need to do these three things today, and it's, takes, they can take that sheet and, and do that. All the information they need is there. Our propagation mix is a, is a compost-based mix that we make ourselves. We're lucky enough to be at the Rodale Institute and have access to lots of good certified organic composts. We take that compost and screen it into a soil pasteurizer that we use to, one, get a nice fine mixture, and then two, the pasteurizer is there to sterilize the mix. We set it at about 190 degrees. That's a good temperature for killing most of your weed seeds, but uh, also allowing some of the beneficial organisms to pass through unscathed. Then we take that mix and we bag it. We use um, just old grain bags. We put one and a half five gallon buckets in each bag. And then we take those bags to our greenhouse and store them for the following year. To our mix, we also add peat, perlite, and vermiculite, as well as bone meal, blood meal, rock phosphate, and lime. And those are the ingredients we use for our mix. Uh, the proportions are a bucket and a half of compost, uh, three quarters a bucket of perlite, three quarters a bucket of vermiculite, three quarters a bucket of peat. And then we add the, uh, the mineral supplements. We use a one pound butter dish and we use a full butter dish of blood meal and green sand. We use a half butter dish of each of lime, rock phosphate, and bone meal. And then we mix those all together with just a square tip spade in a mixing box in the greenhouse. And, and that's the, the mix that works well for us. There's definitely a fair amount of challenges and benefits to working with a compost-based mix. The, the biggest benefit is that, uh, particularly in our mix, is that we have a lot of nutrients in it, so we can hold plants in it if we need to. The biggest challenge with compost-based mixes is damping off. We have a lot of trouble with cucurbits with damping off, and then we also grow a fair amount of flowers for the CSA, and um, celosia is really troublesome for us. You have to be careful with a compost-based mix, one, that you don't water too heavy because they have a tendency to stay wet. And you also have to be careful that you don't let them get dry because they have a tendency once they're dry to be really hard to get wet again and that when you try to water, the water will pull up on the surface and almost evaporate or just spill off before it soaks down to, to deep in the bottom of the cell. We haven't had much difficulty with fertility in our compost-based mix, and I would attribute that to adding the, the mineral supplements. They seem to provide the extra food that the plant needs. And um, we found if, if it's an extreme case where it's really been raining and we really can't get something out, we have used fish emulsion in the past, um, just a, a commercially bought organic approved variety. 
we use a variety of seeding flats. We start off with seedling trays. Those are 20 row or 10 row seedling channel trays. Those are for small things. And in those we can generally fit um, 500 seeds or 500 plants per tray. Those are a nice nursery tray and for putting things on the heating mats, you know, on one heating mat I might be able to start oh, 20,000 plants. So that's a really nice, really nice to be able to consolidate things in that space. From there we'll transplant on, or some things we'll seed directly in a larger cell tray. And then we also have a variety of things that are both are transplanted into or seeded directly into a 72 cell tray. And then we have a, a variety of things that we transplant and seed directly in 50 cell trays. Um, those are the sizes we use. We really like wind strips or injection molded plastic trays. That's a much more sturdy tray. Um, it allows for much better air circulation in between the cells and they will last until you run over them with the tractor. <laughs> those trays will, will st stand up to years of use. We do also use a lot of your traditional, I guess it's kind of a, a softer, flimsier plastic cell tray. And uh, just because we can't quite find uh, some of the harder trays in different cells, cell sizes, or we can't afford them. The basic process is we, we make our compost-based potting mix in a mixing box, which is set up uh, a couple feet off the ground, so you're mixing it at about waist level. Then we'll add water to that mix and mix it up again until we get it sort of thoroughly wetted to the consistency of about a damp sponge. Then we'll put whatever tray we're using that day and stick it onto the mixing box and actually just pull the soil on with our hands, uh, kind of push it into the channels or the cell trays as, as nice and firmly. If it's a seed lean tray with a 10 row or 20 row, we'll, we use um, eighth inch aluminum bars to make a little indentation in each channel in addition to already being in the channel. If it's a cell tray, we'll just use our fingertips to make a little divot in each uh, cell for the seeds to land in. If we're working on a seedling tray, we'll actually count out, maybe it'll be 25 or 50 seeds per row. If it's a cell tray, we'll look at our greenhouse plan, and if it's two cells, two, two seeds per cell, one seed per cell, we'll do that. And we'll, we'll just go in and just sprinkle them between our thumb and forefinger. When we make our potting mix, one thing we always do before we wet it down is we take off one bucket of dry soil mix. And you can take that dry mix, and it's really nice to sprinkle over the top of your seeds. Most seeds, I would say, we bury approximately an eighth to a quarter of an inch deep. A good rule of thumb to try and kind of remember is that the smaller the seed, the less deeply you want to bury it. And the larger the seed, the less it matters how deeply it's buried. You know when something is ready to be transplanted out of, out of the channel seeding flats? When we generally say the rule of thumb is that when there are two true leaves on the plant. There is flexibility in that though. You can let a plant get a little bigger or if it's a rainy day and you have nothing else to do and it's only got one true leaf, you can do it. It'll be fine. And then we actually use a butter knife. Works perfectly to just zip down and scoop all the plants out of, out of the channel tray. We'll then kind of take that long strip of plants in your fingers and you can kind of loosen up the soil, tease them out a little bit. And then we'll pull them out sort of one by one by their leaves and you can kind of gently tap them on the table to get the remainder of the potting mix off. We'll then take a pencil, that's our preferred potting, to, potting on tool. We'll take that and poke a hole in each cell. And then you can take your, your plant and just basically take it down and, and using the pencil kind of push the roots all the way down to the bottom of the cell. You can generally plant at the two leaf stage. You can take most things and transplant them on and have them be buried all the way up to the base of their cotyledon leaves that way. If a plant is more leggy, you can also take that pencil and sort of bend over the stem and the root a little bit inside that hole and push it down to the bottom again to get it planted nice and deep. We like to use a Wonder Water watering wand and uh, we found that works really well for both larger plants and small, really, really tiny seedlings. For really tiny plants you can actually turn it upside down so it waters them really gently. For larger plants you can turn it right side down, so to speak, and you can really water even larger plants from some six feet away. Air circulation is always an, an issue in the greenhouse because it is such a humid environment, and the, the best way you can deal with that is um, by, one, having ventilation fans in the greenhouse. Those help keep air, at least the air that's in the house, moving a little bit and keep the, the foliage of the plants dry, which is an important aspect of preventing disease. Beyond that, the most important preventative measure we can take is sterilizing our cell trays and also using our cell trays only once per season. The biggest pieces of advice I could give are to 
to go look at other people's facilities. And um, if you can, if it's at all possible to go work for somebody else. And I always tell people, regardless of what you're trying to learn, that it's, it's good to go to somebody, try and find someone who has a really good reputation for what you're doing and go learn from them. And also to work for someone who's maybe large scale um, because they'll have learned a methods of efficiency that po possibly you won't think of. And the other thing I would say that's most important is is build the biggest greenhouse you can afford and that you can and that you have space for. Um, no matter what you think, you'll always end up at some point being limited by the space you have. Mm -hmm.